Did you ever come across police corruption in your time? Oh yeah, yeah, no doubt about it. I mean, there was a lot of it in the old days. And I should imagine there's still some of it now. I remember back in the 80s, I robbed, um, me and my pal robbed the building society. Split up the money. I'm on the way home with mine, it's in a hold I'll get stopped by two flying squad who recognise me. Search the bag, see the money, but what are you doing with this? So I said, I was going to bring it to the police station, but I it is. That's why we landed it. a few of the uh, well-known Essex criminals. Yeah, yeah, I mean, back in the 90s, um, Pat Tate, I've always got on with Pat, I thought he was a nice geezer. I used to, uh, we had a little bit of a business in HMP Albany when it was a dispersal on the Isle of Wight. And we used to do cards, me and my pal. He used to do the drawings and I used to write the, write the poems. And it was things like, uh, you know, you could send them to people who grasped you up and that would be a little hanging man on the front or something, you know what I mean? Pat used to buy a lot of them send the people in Essex <laughs> and I always got on great with Pat I always found him to be a perfect gentleman I know a lot of people said that he was a bully and this and that and maybe he was but that was never the face that I ever seen and to be honest with you I was quite gutted when I found out he was dead to in the cells in Albany they're quite small so when Pat used to come into my cell he had to duck his head down to, from the door to get in he filled up the cell you know what I mean he, was, he had a lot of charisma Pat he was one of them geezers when he was there you knew he was there you know what I mean yeah, he had a little guy with him as well, and I never remember his name, but he was from Southern as well. We used to call him Bam Bam. He was an hairdresser, uh, like a really good barber, and he had this mad like bunch of hair on his head. And he was even robbing a security van or something. But he was like him. Pat used to knock that thing together, obviously, because they're both from Southern. We said, right, I'll get out of my cell, right, because we've got it all worked out. I'll get out of my cell, I'll do the night watchman, get his keys and open up everywhere and we'll fuck off. This was the plan. Christmas Eve, my birthday, how could it go wrong? <laughs> so, sure enough, what I've done is, a couple of days before, I've cut the cup out of my lock. So now, when the lock is closed from the outside, I can actually see the bolt going in from this side. And if I pull, I can open the door. But there's a, a bolt outside as well, which they close and I've got a strip thing, but it was screwed in. So we've, what we've done was took all the screws out, so when the screw goes down there, I can take the strip out, coat hanger out, undo the bolt, and then pull my door open. I'm out. <laughs> Skate-proof fucking wing, they spent millions on it. So I'm out, right, about half nine, I'm out myself. So I've gone around everyone's spiral going, listen, listen, I'm going to do the night watchman, and then we're, they're going, yeah, yeah, we'll be home for Christmas Day, everyone's well happy. And while I'm talking to someone, I hear the night watchman coming up the stairs. So how it works was this. This is how the wing was. you got the centre office there. Then you've got stairs up there and you've got a spur there. Stairs up there and a spur there. Same on the other side. And at the end of each spur corridor is a, a time clock that he has to turn the night watchman every hour to make sure he's not asleep. And um, he's come up. So at the end of the spur, there's a recess with toilets and, and your showers and all that cleaning equipment. So I've quickly nipped in there. Don't forget, it's all lit up, the corridors, because it's, you know, it's, it's night, but it's only about half nine. So I'm in this, this little uh, recess, and he comes up, and I hear him whistling. And he goes down, turns his thing, and I think, great, he's going back down. As he's come down, he decides he needs a piss. So whistling, no, he was singing. He come into the toilet. And I'm in the back of the toilet like this, and it's all dark, and there's mop buckets and uh, brooms and shit. And he, he has a piss singing to himself, and then he goes to wash his hands, and he looks in the mirror, he glances up in the mirror, and he sees me in the corner. At first, he doesn't believe it. He's like, 
And as he's turned around like that, I've picked up the nearest thing, which is a steel mop bucket, crashed it straight over his head. He's gone running out into the corridor, and out in the corridor, bang, I've hit him twice again with this steel mop bucket. Blood everywhere. You know what I mean? He's unconscious. Blood everywhere. And everyone was looking out through their hatches, and they were going, no, don't open me up. I don't want nothing to do with this, because they think I've killed him. Oh. So now I'm the only one out, and he's unconscious. And no one else wants nothing to do with it. Even my best pal. Are you, let, let's go. No, 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 no. I can't be involved in that. Oh, you fucking wankers. So I've gone downstairs to the office to try and find the keys. He ain't got nothing on him. And uh, when I'm searching through the drawers in the office, I suddenly hear the alarm bell going. What's that? So I've come out of the office and I've looked up the top of the stairs where the bell is, and he's there with his finger on the bell, blood all down him and smiling. And he's going, you're fucking getting it now. <laughs> And I've gone, oh, no. <laughs> so I've just kneeled down on the floor, put my hands up, and the night patrol come in, and they battered me. I swear to God, they mullered me. And then one of them held my arms behind my back and said to the night watchman, give him a few digs. But he was so weak from loss of blood that they weren't really hurt me, but I was <laughs> pretending they were, ah, and all that. Anyway, they f take me down a block, Christmas Eve, throw me into um, the punishment cell, the cell within a cell, the cage. Nothing in there. They took all my clothes. They beat the shit out of me. I'm covered in bruises. Uh, I was vomiting up blood that night. They hit me so many times in the stomach. Bloody so hell. I'm in this, this hole. There's nothing in there except the hole in the floor to piss down. And that's it. And the next morning, Christmas Day, door opens and the screws who weren't on duty last night have come in to give me a beating because I've done their mate. So oh, for two shit. weeks, when they're coming on duty, they're coming straight down to me to give me an hiding. So I get done for... So you didn't get a Christmas card then? Nah. <laughs> Christmas Day was a nightmare. So I get done with gross personal violence on a prison officer and um, attempting to escape. So I'm a Section 53. They can't lose me bird. I have to do all my sentence. So they've got me down here in front of the Board of Visitors. And the Board of Visitors said to me, because we can't... They said, your record is absolutely atrocious. And because we can't um, lose you any remission... They said, what we propose is we're going to leave you indefinitely in solitary confinement. I was 15. No, I was 16 then. I turned 16 on Christmas Eve. So I'm battered down in this fucking cell for months. Nine months I ended up in there. But they never. the, the thing about it was they would never tell you when you were leaving. This is what used to happen. Every day, imagine this, every day the governor comes down to the block and he goes round every cell to see everybody in the block. That's his job. He has to see everyone in the cell. And what they do is this. They open you, the chief opens your door, the governor's standing there, two screws behind him, and you're supposed to stand to attention and give your name and number to the governor. Smith, PJ2679, sir. And that's what you had to do. And I've done this for about a week. And then I thought, to myself, because you're hoping that the governor is going to say, instead of, very good, Smith, and walk away, you're hoping he's going to say, you're going back to the wing today, so you pin all your hopes on that. When's the governor coming? Is he going to let me get back to the wing? And then it's no. There was no smoking down there. There was nothing. It was a rule of silence. So after a couple of months, I went, oh, fucking had enough of this. So I thought, right, I'm going to show my displeasure. And they let me out to <coughs> uh, use the recess to empty my bucket. And someone had left uh, the Financial Times, one of the screws, obviously, in the toilet cubicle where he'd been reading it when he was having his pony, I should imagine. So I quickly put that under me thing. I couldn't read. Went into my cell. I set it all up, and the next morning I could hear the governor coming, and I was sitting on the floor with a paper like that. I couldn't even read it, with me back to the door. And I opened the door, name and number to the governor, stand to attention. I went, all right, governor, I'm well, going back today. No, you're not, stand to attention. Piss off then. And carried on <laughs> pretending I was reading this paper. So <coughs> they kind of see me as um, a no-over. You know, I mean, I was just a mug who was always going to be in prison. In fact, I ended up getting my um, a lot of my paperwork from that time under the Data Protection Act 1997. And I read in 1977 in Rochester Ballstall, a deputy governor wrote in my record, Smith, I always remember this, Smith is one of a small group of boys who will spend their lives in and out of institutions. Give him nothing. Right, so I was written off at the age of 16. So, uh, you know, I'm in this block and I was down there for nine months and I went a bit mad. Uh, there was no, no talking, no singing. Uh, you could only talk if a screw spoke to you. And uh, I, I went mad. I couldn't hear nothing. So 
If you put your ear up to the door, because it was underground and it was echoey, you, all you could hear was the echo of the screw's voices talking in it, but you couldn't hear what they were saying. So I got into this stage where I was putting my ear up to the door and thinking I heard them talking about my mum, that they were going to kill my mum. This is what I convinced myself. So I started attacking them again, and when that had no effect, I, I thought I could still hear them talking about my mum. So what I'd done was I broke the, the bit of metal off my zip, of my jeans, and rubbed it up and down the wall for like about a fucking day and a half until it was sharp. And then I stuck it into my arm there, into my wrist, and uh, ripped all my veins out. As you can see, there's still a Bloody horrible hell. scar there. I probably fucking pulled it out. That, that must be really taking a sort of toll on your mental. Oh yeah, like, I was mad. Like when you're sort of stuck on your own for yeah. 24 hours a day. Yeah, as a kid, I was mad as a hatter, seriously, because of that, because I'm in solitary confinement. The boredom of it, I couldn't read. Every day, just counting the bricks in this cell, there was no window. The window was covered in perspex, but because it had been there since 1908, everyone had scratched their names in it, had no light come through, really. So I'm in this, this room, walking around, playing <coughs> with my socks, playing football with my socks and things like that. It was crazy. And standing in the corner, I was standing in the corner of the cell, and redo all the films I'd ever seen. I'd like act all the parts out really quietly or sing songs. But they'd hear me and come down and bang on the door, shut up! And then I'd go really quiet in the corner and start talking to myself. But I went absolutely mad. They took me out of the block and they stitched me up, or they cleaned up my wrist and then sent me back into the block. And a month later, they then called me and said, look, if we let you up onto a wing, are you willing to behave yourself now? If you behave yourself, uh, this was a deputy governor, he said, if you behave yourself for 12 months, he said, I will recommend your parole at the next hearing. So I thought, can I trust this geezer? But he seemed all right. So I said, all right, I'll do that. So I'd learned to read and write in the block through a priest, give me some easy reader books and stuff like that. So I could basically read and write. And I got out there, out the block, they put me on D-wing, no, E-wing, and I knew some guys, but most people had gone home since I'd been in the block for nine months. Most of them oh, thought yeah. I was a new geezer. So I had to fight my way through that again. Um, That's a long time to be down there, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah it was a whole prison. It was no a whole sort of for most of anyone else. Yeah, yeah. yeah except the it screws must have made you feel like me. depressed and stuff, didn't it? Mate, it drove me mad, seriously. The screws hated me and I hated them. Imagine the only people you see every day is people you hate and who hate you and make it plain. They used to spit my dinner and everything while I was giving it to me. It was fucking mental. But you learn to live with that. You know, you, the thing is, we're adaptable. Humans can learn to live with anything. And uh, they let me out anyway, out of the block. And I still had about two years to serve. And then they put me on a course called Skilled Ops, which was uh, basically a building course. And I loved it. I really loved doing scaffolding down at the yard and all that sort of stuff in the prison. And um, learned to drive a dumper truck. And it, it was great. So they kind of give me a little leeway. Yeah. And I behaved myself then for 12 months, and then they said, right, we recommend you for parole. And the parole board went, bollocks, have you seen his record? Don't matter how many times you recommend and not getting it. So now they, they think I'm going to go back to my old ways, yeah. right, because I'm not getting out. So the AG says to me, the assistant governor, he said, look, keep up your good behaviour. He said, I will make sure that you will get home leave at least this year. So I thought, right, fuck it, I'll do it. So I behaved myself then. And uh, sure enough, 1979, they, uh, they give me a two-week home leave, and when I come back, they give me parole. So I got out for two weeks. And at that time, I was working in Rochester Borstal underground. I was a plumber's mate. I was working with one of the worksmen, and we was doing the sewers. So during the really hot weather in 1979, I was underground in there. And when I come out and they let me go home, it was mental. So I come out of prison, finished me three years. I've done every day of it. Got out in 1980. And it uh, was good for nothing. Good so for what nothing, age you then? About, about 19 tonight? Yeah, 18, just 18. over 18, yeah. And I'm, I'm absolutely good for nothing. I can't get a job uh, because I've just served three years in prison and a three-month sentence before that, and I'm only 18. So, you know, that tells you something. Um, so I've decided, after a little while, I had a bit of fucking about because like, I was a teenager and I joined a gang, started up a gang of rockabillies in South London. We used to go to all the clubs, fight all the other rockabillies, fight the skinheads, and it was great. <laughs> and I settled down, met a bird, had a couple of kids. and um, But I was still a criminal. You know, I, I thought there was no other way. So I started robbing again, um, mainly on my own. I'd done a lot of robberies on my own, and I would do them about every two months or something. When I needed money, I'd go in and rob somewhere. I got out of Wandsworth Prison in 1988. 
I was nicked for possession of a fire, semi-automatic firearm and they give me two years. And they let me out in 19, January 1988 and I said, well, I need a travel warrant and, and like um, some money, discharge grant. They said, you, you can't get a discharge grant. I can't remember why, it was something to do with something. They said, but we'll give you a travel warrant. I said, if you don't give me some money to get out with, I'm going to nick some money. They went, we'll crack on. Got out Wandsworth, down Trinity Road to uh, Tootenheim Street. Uh, see a bank there, thought, right. Search for a bin nearby, McDonald's bag over my hand. Uh, wrapped the scarf around my face, went in, had an atom, went, give me the money. Walked out with seven grand. So that was basically my fuck, keep your money, I'll get my And that was on the day you've got released? Yeah, the day I got released. So I became really a fucking, I was one of those kind of guys who was always game for anything. You know, you could, they knew, people knew, turn up at my house and say, listen, do you want to carry the gun on a robbery? And I'd be there, you know. And um, so I started working with a, a crew called The Little Firm, who are all dead now, funny enough. But um, they were a right good little robbery team and they were doing hitting places around South London and I've worked with them. I've done a couple of supermarkets with them. They always wanted me to carry the gun because I was the biggest out of everyone. I was quite a lump. I was about 18 stone. I had all my hair, white teeth. You know what I mean? And I could growl like fuck and people obeyed what I said because I was so used to it. So we committed a series of robberies everywhere. We was robbing all over London and South East. And uh, eventually, I was arrested, as I say, for the firearm, and that brought the fire, flying squad onto me again because I had previous robbery, and now I'm getting nicked for a semi-automatic firearm. Um, and I, I, I decided, after all the robberies, 1986, 1987, my daughter was born. So I had two sons and a daughter, and I had a, a lovely wife. We weren't married, but we lived in a place down in Clapham. And I thought to myself, you know what, I've had enough of this going to jail. I was always in and out of fucking jail for little things. So I said, I'm going to give it up. And a mate of mine offered me a job as a hod carrier. So I said, yeah, sweet. So I went work to work as a hod carrier. I'm earning great money. I think we were on £90 a day in the end then. That was back in 86. So we were doing great. Had a nice little motor. You know, getting on great at home. Finally give up crime. Went out for a night out. My brother and my sister was down in Loughborough, the Loughborough Hotel in Brixton. Uh, we're down there. It's packed. And it's about two in the morning. And my brother sidles up to me and went, he said, there's some geezer over there. He said, he's giving it a big one about Samantha, who's our sister. He's saying some things about Samantha that I don't like. I said, well, chin him. He said, I would. He said, but he's got about five of his mates with him. He said, are you talked up? So I said, no. So my other mate was there, and he heard it, and he went, here, yeah, and he gave me a razor, a cutthroat razor. He said, I've had this. So I've put it in my back pocket. Anyway, I've gone over to the geezer, tried to have it out. He was a bit leery. So I said, mate, listen, I'll see you outside. So he said, yeah, club finishes at three o'clock, off we go, walking down to Brixton High Street, all of a sudden, no, we got to the kebab shop. So I'm outside the kebab shop having a smoke, my mates are in there getting the kebab. And uh, all of a sudden, these four geezers are coming across the road, Whitehall's Road, and they're shouting, you're fucking dead. And I'm thinking, are they talking to me? I'm looking around, <laughs> oh, yeah, they fucking are. So I've gone out in the middle of the road, Brixton High Street, three in the morning, the first one comes, his name was Patrick Anlon, I remember that from the statements. And as he's come flying up, I've gone crack, right out there, he's gone sparko on the road. I thought, fucking lovely. But the other three have then steamed into me. So I'm on the floor, I'm getting, my mates are in the kebab shop, they don't know what's going on. So I'm getting my head kicked in by these three geezers on the floor, I'm getting really laced. And I remember the razor. So I've pulled the razor out, boom, cut out, done one of them across the face. So he's kind of jumped back. Hey, he's, he's got a knife, he's got a knife. So the other one's turned around to run, the one who was proper doing me, and he had a long leather trench coat on. And as he's gone to run away, I've run the razor down his back really hard, and it broke, the blade broke off. But it cut straight through it. So he's gone legging it, and then I've got another one, and cut him, got him in a corner, cut him across the face, and it went from there up across his head. So... And I think, right, you've steamed into me, you know, you've ended up coming unstuck. That's your fucking problem, there's four of you. By this time, my two pals have come out, but one's a hippie pacifist and don't want nothing to do with it. <laughs> and my other pal, Dave, has jumped on one of the geezers, and I've gone to slash the geezer across the neck, and, and I've done Dave's arm. So Dave's pulled his arm away and put the other, and I've done him again. So I've done my pal twice in the arm. He, he's bleeding all over the place. But we've ended up, like, I've got home. That was on a Saturday night. Monday morning... Five o'clock in the morning, bang, bang, bang on the door. I thought, it's fucking hard, Bill. And I had a semi-automatic rifle in the house. So I thought, I hope they're not coming to search. So I've opened the door. 
you're arrested for a serious assault, um, attempted murder. Uh, anyway, they come in and eventually they're searching the house. So I said to me, Mrs. Get the brief. They got me all handcuffed up. And they're looking down the side. They're looking for the razor, which they find in the bathroom. And then they're looking down the side of the chair and they find the gun. This is how stupid they are. One of the coppers, one of the constables, has gone, aha, uh -huh. he's pulled the chair away, saw this rifle, and he's took a pen out, Sarge, and he's tried to put it through the handle and lift, the gun weighs four pounds. He's trying to lift it up with a pen and it went boom, straight off and hit the ground. And the sergeant went, if that's loaded, you could have just <laughs> shot yourself. <laughs> but he's seen it obviously on American cop shows where they pick up the gun with a pen. <laughs> anyway, they've, they've nicked me, because I've ended up charged with uh, murder, uh, attempted murder, two malicious woundings, which were GBH with intent, possession of a, a semi-automatic firearm. Now, I don't know. I, I'm in the police cells in Brixton, and they've brought me out, and there's a board, and it's got who's in all the cells and what they're in for. And I've glanced up, and I've seen this murder, attempted murder. I've thought, oh, he's in trouble. And I've looked, it's my name. I went, fucking hell. And what had happened was, just down the road from where we'd had this fight that night, a cab driver had had his throat cut and was robbed. So they're tying the two things together yeah. because they're saying it was done with a Stanley knife or a razor. Right, so he's dead. I don't know nothing about this. I've got nothing to do with it at all, but it's outside the pub where we were. So they've nicked me for that. They've nicked me for attempted murder on the geezer who got the slash straight across his head. And they've nicked me for malicious wounding and the other two in possession of a firearm. And when they've got me in the thing, the two, the two CID were funny as fuck. One of them's name was Duncan Redpath. I think he ended up on the um, anti-terrorist squad. But he went, they're smiling when I'm sitting in front. I said, what's so funny? And he went, I'll tell you what's so funny. He said, we're Brixton police. He said, we've got you, a white man, for stabbings and slashings, and you can't say it's racial. He said, we're going to get you convicted, no problem. He said, everyone else screams it's racial uh, interference or whatever, or discrimination. So I went, well, I've never done that. Then. So I'm pleading not guilty all the way through. So they reminded me in custody. And every time I go to go up for bail, they say, uh, the prosecution comes up and says, no, uh, automatic firearm was found. Uh, there's going to be war over this, you know, three men were seriously injured, blah, blah, blah. Oh, eventually they dropped the cab driver because they find out it wasn't me. They actually got the geezer for that. But I'm already on remand in the scrubs. So I'm on remand for 11 months. Bearing in mind, before that, I'd been doing, I'd had a job and I'd given up crime and everything. So I end up going on remand for seven, uh, 11 months. And my trial's coming up just before Christmas. So the one thing I thought to myself, it all hinges on ID, right? Because a lot of people... The witness all give my identification. So I thought, while I'm in prison, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to grow my hair, because I had a proper quiff, not grease it up anymore, have a light, smoothie haircut, and grow a moustache. But I went too far. I was growing a moustache for about four months, and it ended up this horrible ginger moustache, <laughs> and it was like, ran like that. So I've gone up to court for the trial, and it was a woman judge. This is uh, four days before Christmas. And they, they put the case off three or four times. So I'm in front of this judge and my brief stands up and says, look, Mr. Smith has been remanded in custody for 11 months. He said he's, you know, they, the prosecution keep coming up saying they want to start the trial and then put it off. He said it can't be my client's fault that they're not ready. So this, I'm, I ain't expected bail in a million years, not for those charges. But this woman went, has Mr. Smith any children? So my brief's gone, yes, he's got three young children. And they're going to be without their father at Christmas if I remind him back in custody. I'm thinking, Jesus Christ. So she said, look, I can't see uh, where the evidence is. She said, it's not prima facie evidence on this. It's a triable matter, that, which is why we're going to trial. She said, so what I propose to do is, because the prosecution ain't ready, give Mr. Smith bail over Christmas and come back on January the 10th for trial. And she said, and if the prosecution aren't ready, think about dropping the charges. I'm thinking, great, so I got out for Christmas, but when I, my brother picked me up, it was in the London Crown Court, and he picked me up, and my old man was in a pub down in Brixton, so he's brought me down to my old man, and me and my brother walked into the pub, and my old man looked at me, glanced at me, looked at my brother, and he said, what happened to him? And he went, he's here, and my old man looked, went, what? I had this huge, big Did fucking ginger, you? no, he didn't recognise <laughs> me, I thought, that's great, but I had to shave it off once I come outside. Anyway, I ended up going to trial in the January, and uh, got found not guilty on the malicious woundings, got found not guilty on the GB, because they all, all the victims had previous for violence, you wouldn't yeah. believe, two of them were boxers. But um, yeah, I got found not guilty on everything,
But then they said, possession of a firearm, you have to plead guilty to. It's, it's been found in your possession. So I said, well, what's the maximum? They went three years. I said, what do you think I'll get? He said, well, you, you ain't going to get the maximum. You'll probably get 12 months and you've done that on remand. So I went, all right. So after, after the jury have come, it was the quickest jury in, in the London Crown Court history. Six minutes they went out and then found me not guilty of every single crime. So they trooped back in. Now I'm thinking, in a London, the jury, I'm looking at them first when I go into court, and they all look all white, you know. There's a young kid in a leather jacket, chewing gum. There's like fairly young people. There's a couple of black guys. I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, you know, good jury. They don't look all posh or anything. Sure enough, they went out to, to, to find their verdict, and they took me down. And in London, it's a really big court, and it's all underground down to the cells. And by the time we got down to the cells, the screws escorted me, the phone on the wall rings and the other screw picks up, he said, your jury are back in. So I've gone, and the screw went, it's been six minutes, how are they back in? He said, ah, they're probably going to ask a question about the evidence. So we went, all right, back up in court. Now, as the jury are coming in, I'm looking at them and the geezer in a leather jacket, as he's coming, he's gone like that. And I'm thinking, is he going, we got you, you muck, you're going away, <laughs> or is he going, you're sweet? So I soon found out, and they stood up, did you find a defendant guilty? Not guilty, not guilty. Now the prosecution, I gutted. The judge who hated me is gutted, right? Because he's <laughs> been there for all this. And um, so the prosecution says, oh, it all hinged on this. They asked me, the police, have you ever carried a razor on the streets of London with intent? And I, I, now, because they can't mention my previous, I'm up in a box saying to the prosecutor, no, sir. He knows. He knows my previous one, right? but he can't say nothing in front of the jury. So he's like that. He's screwing. Are you sure, Mr. Smith? Think again. Nope. I've never carried a weapon. No, I can honestly say that. So I get the jury go out. I get found not guilty of the GBHs. And then the judge says, right, Mr. Smith has to plead guilty to the firearms charge. The jury are like that. They've not heard no firearms charge because it's a separate charge. I'm pleading guilty. So the prosecution said... I, Your Honour, he said, I'd like the jury to stay here and listen to this. I'm thinking, oh, no. So the, the judge says, it, the prosecution says, the jury are all there. He said, where shall I start on the previous convictions? And he said, try 1979. So he's gone, right. 1979, you're arrested for possession of a cutthroat razor with intent. The jury all like that. Right? <laughs> 1982, arrested for a flick knife. 1983, arrested for a cutthroat razor with intent. I've just swore blind that I've never carried one and they're all sitting there listening. Like that. I thought, oh, I've, I've dread the next person they're the jury for. <laughs> so, so anyway, the judge has like, had his little laugh with it all and then he's gone, right, how do you plead to the firearm? I said, guilty when you go to prison for three years. That's the maximum, that's what you're getting. Because he sat through the trial. Yeah. Off I go, go downstairs again, get downstairs. They put me in the cell and a, the screw opens the door again and went, you've got to come back up, the judge wants to see you. Thinking, fuck you now, what's he going to do now? So he brought me back up. So I was still in the box. He said, I've been advised by the clerk of the court that three years is the maximum and three years will be appealable. He said, so what I propose to do is to give you uh, um, two years of it suspended. Now I've already done my time on remand. So I'm delighted. I got out. and, and But that was my life fuck then. Where I'd been working before and everything was going great, now I get out, I've got nothing. I've got to start again. Right, square one, yeah. Yeah, the job's finished, you know, oh, they've yeah. moved on. I've had to sell me car and everything while I'm in jail to, like, survive in prison for the family to survive. So I get out with absolutely fucking niche. So, obviously, I said to myself, well, fuck this, going straight long, it ain't no good. I'll go back to robbery, which I did, and I was robbing ever since. I actually plotted up, I, I ended up getting 19 years for robbery in 1989, 1988. And what happened was that, uh, I can't remember which robberies, uh, no, no, yeah, I've got 19 years for those robberies. And I'm in Wandsworth, looking for an escape as usual. <laughs> and, uh, and what happened is, in 1990, when I was in there, they had, uh, what was happening in Wandsworth was the yard, the sterile area between the yard and the wing uh, was being repaired, it was being dug up. So you couldn't get to it as a prisoner. You could see through the fence the workmen working on it, and then there's the wall further over, and there'd be screws with them. So a lot of the category A's on my wing, and there's some right heavy geezers on D-wing. Uh, yeah, D-wing. Uh, had planned an escape. Now, I didn't know about it. They'd already planned it. But what happened was, my mate, Jimmy, went to me, listen, if you fancy it, tag on, we're going today off the yard. 
So I said, well, what's the fucking plan? So he quickly told me the plan. And what they're going to do is, on the yard, there's 150 prisoners, probably about 80 category A's, the rest are category B's. Uh, one of the great train robbers was there, Freddie Foreman was there, all people that you'd know, you know what I mean, on that yard. And um, Tommy Wisby, the great train robber. But um, yeah, what happened was, on the yard, they, they had a little gate that the screws would open with the bins to bring two cons with the bins through. And that led out to the sterile area, but they'd let them through and quickly lock it. There was two screws on the gate. So what happened was, we're all walking around in a circle in the yard, and someone gave the shout that the trolley was coming through the gate. Uh, I don't know what's happening. Five geezers have pulled on masks, like made out of the sleeves of sweatshirts, pulled tools out, like bottles and bed legs, and gone run, running over to the, to the gate and done the screws. Done the two screws, knocked them sparko, pulled the trolley out of the way, legged it out, and everyone else legged it behind them. Oh, so you've got seven of them running out, all masked up with things. I ain't got a mask, but I've got a tool. No, I didn't even have a tool, because I only heard about it last minute. So I've gone legging over to try and get it out, but another screw has slammed the gate. So now seven of them are in the sterile area where the builders are, and they've got a JCB out there, right? Now the is, plan is that like a locked the confinement still, that bit? Still locked? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, the JCB, what happened was, when they saw the JCB, they got someone to smuggle a JCB key in, in case it wasn't running, because the plan was to reverse the JCB into the fence, so 150 prisoners got off the yard, and then smash it through Wandsworth Wall, so they would be spread over South London, running yeah. every different way. So that was the plan. And there was a guy called Tony, who was an Irish fella, who reckoned he'd be driving JCB since he was 12. So anyway, they come running out with a mask on, picked up shovels and tools and stuff, chased the workmen off. They all legged it with the screws. They've jumped up on the JCB, got Tony into the driver's seat, and it turned out he was a bullshit. He'd never driven a JCB in his life. Now is not the time to find that out. So they're all standing up on the JCB. We're all in the yard watching them. We can't get out, so we're watching them through the fence. All shit, go on, lads. And the alarm bells are going off everywhere. So they're up on the JCB. They've got the shovels now that they've took off the workmen and they're all on J and he's trying to start it. It was already started, but it was on the stands. It was on the, and he's trying to get off the stands so it can go on the That's tracks. Right. So he's pushing buttons and it's the arms going up and all sorts of things. And they're going, hurry up, you fucking idiot. The screws are now coming from everywhere in the prison. So they've all legged it. All the screws are coming, but they can't get near the JCB because they've all got shovels on the JCB. So where the ground's all dug up and it's all rubble, one of the screws has an idea, there's about 50 screws there. And he went, get the rubble! And he's picked up big lumps of what, and they start pelting the JCB, about 40 screws, rocks oh, bouncing yeah. off people's heads. All the windows were smashed out, it was wrecked. They had to pay out a fortune to get a new JCB from. But we're on the yard, so we can't get to them. We'd see this going on. So I went, nah, this ain't... Like We're all over at the fence and the screws are trying to move us away. Come on, get away from the fence, trying to pull us away. One pulls me backwards and as I go backwards, just on a spot, like, without even thinking of it, crack, I've hit him straight in the fucking jaw. He's gone flying back a few steps against the fence and I thought, well, that's it. I'm in it now, you know what I mean? So I've turned around, there's another screw coming, crack, and I've gone into him and I'm laying on the floor doing him. We're rolling around the floor, then another screw hits me with a truncheon. And then another guy, Jimmy McGinley, psycho, who's a huge big Scotsman, that, that he starts fighting the screws as well. But out of 150 people in the yard, two of us, oh, two of us fighting the screws. And they eventually done us, dragged us in, and then they come and took us down the block and they beat the absolute shit out of us, tortured us, everything, mate. Threatened to kill us down there. What do you mean when you say torture? To us? Well, I'll tell you what they do. They do this thing where they, um, when you go down a block, if you get taken down a block normally, what happens is they take you down the steps, they put you in your cell, they get you the strip, and they've got a card, and they, they ask you things like, to put on the card, name, number, date of birth, diet, are you vegetarian, or what, you know, all that sort of, so they put it in the card. But while they're doing this to us, they're beating the shit out of us. They got me in the cell, and they pulled the hairs out of my chest as soon as they got my shirt off, stamping on my bare feet with their boots and all that, you know, poking me in the eye. And, and that the screw at the door is still shouting out questions, and you've got to answer them, no matter what you're going through. So one of the screws has got me up against the back wall of the cell, and he's got his, his arm over my neck like that, and my face is squashed against the wall. And the screw at the door shouts out, what diet are you? And I went, vegetarian, because I was a vegetarian then. And the screw's got me up against the wall, he's put his mouth right up to my ear, and he's gone, ah, you were full of fucking beans this morning, weren't you? <laughs> and, I went, and I nearly laughed, you know what I mean? I found it quite funny. But we, were, we got battered, and we were down there for uh, weeks, and we kicked off down there, and eventually they charged us all, 
and they charged me with gross personal violence to two prison officers and inciting a riot, which carries a 10 year sentence. So the rest of them, they shipped out, they're all cut they've got other nicks until the trial. And me, they've decided to do me with the board of visitors, who are the visiting magistrates. They can lose you unlimited bird, right? So I could have lost my whole 19 year sentence there. So eventually, what happens is, less than 1% of prisoners are allowed legal representation on a board of visitors case, and it has to be a serious case. So I got in touch with my brief and said, listen, you've got to come and defend me on this in Wandsworth against the board of visitors. He said, I fucking will, he's a QC now. But he, um, he come down at Wandsworth, and they took me for this trial, and the screws were dead serious I was going to get done. I was the only one left in the prison out of everyone who attacked them. And uh, 12 screws marched me over to this courtroom in the education centre, and I had my brief, and the prison that had uh, a, a top prosecutor from the Treasury Office come down to prosecute the case. So I had two witnesses. The screws had, I think it was 73 witnesses. So my brief has eventually got to it and went, look, we don't need to call every single witness because they're all saying the same things. So the board of visitors went, yeah, because what happened was the first screw come in and he went, uh, why did you, how did you know Smith, I'm charged with inciting a riot, how did you know Smith was inciting the riot? He said, well, it was quite obvious. He was standing there waving his arms around and he shouted, let's do it for strange ways because strange ways had just gone off. I never said nothing like that. Tell like him lies. Yeah, so the next one comes in, says exactly the same thing. Next one comes in, exactly, my brief went, wait a minute. He said, have any of you officers colluded in your uh, evidence? No, no, we don't talk to each other. Why are you all using the same exact same statement when you come in here? We don't need to hear the rest of them. So the board of visitors went, no, we, we've heard enough. So I've got two witnesses. One of them was one of the most hated geezers on the wing in Wandsworth. He was a horrible little junkie. He was like always on the cadge, you know, one of them geezers. And nobody liked him and he looked a bit greasy. I still remember his name. I'm not going to say it though. But he, he, he offered to be my witness. I'd never even spoken to him. So I thought, well, I need a witness. And then I had another one who was my mate, Johnny. So the prosecutor says to my witness, the first one, the, the junkie, he said, Mr. Sanzo, he said, uh, you've told us that you've seen the whole incident and Mr. Smith was in no way in sight the right. He went, yeah, that's right. He said, well, Mr. Smith, he said, Mr. Sanzo, he said, why should we believe that? You're in prison. You've got 27 previous convictions. Why should we believe you? And then when I tell you why, he said, because none of my uh, convictions are for perjury. He said, I've always pleaded guilty if you look at my record. He said, I've never told lies. I'm not a liar. He said, I'm a thief and a junkie, but I'm not a liar. Fair and point. I could see the board of visitors geezer going, hmm, yeah, yeah, and they fair. believed him. <laughs> so I ended up getting not guilty. I could not believe it. Not guilty on everything. Now, when they're bringing me out, the screws, right, there's all screws waiting outside, and the eight escort screws are coming towards them, and I see the one next to me, one of them went, what'd he get? And he went, like he's got not guilty, I'm thinking they're going to kill me. So they kept me back to the cell, put me in the cell and went, uh, we'll be coming to see you. Might not be tomorrow, not, might not be next week, might coming. not be next month. <laughs> We're coming, you can't do that to us and expect to walk away scot-free and I'm thinking, oh no. Lucky enough, the next day they come and took me and shipped me out to the Isle of Wight. They went, yeah. get him out of the jail. The <laughs> governor went, I ain't having this, get him out. So I ended up on the Isle of Wight. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right, so we're going to start to wind it up there. Okay. But yeah. Obviously, you've got your own book out. So if people want to hear some more about your story and about your life, where can they find that and what is your book called? Well, I've got a lot of books out, but the best one to read if you want to read what I've been talking about in more detail is uh, A Few Kind Words and a Loaded Gun, which is, uh, is out in Penguin Books. It came out in 2004. You can probably get it second hand for about a pound on eBay. Um, but I have got a, 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 a new book out, The Dirty Dozen, uh, that's out with John Blake, and that's actually about the British brothers um, and the robbery sprees of the early 90s when they were nicking really good money and they all got put in by a supergrass. So, yeah, get that if you can. Yeah, lovely. Thanks for coming on, Razor. Really nice appreciate it. Is there anywhere else people can find you if they want to follow your stuff? Or I'm on Facebook, really. Noel Razor Smith on Facebook or Noel Stephen Smith if people want to get in touch with me. I don't really go on the Razor Smith one as much, but I do every now and again. So, yeah. Lovely. Thank you very, very so much no for coming on. Appreciate no it.